I am new to the shop organization, but I come out of a storied history as a shopper marketer, having worked on brands such as Procter & Gamble, um, Hallmark, etc., cetera, um, over a, let's just at least say, 15-year spectrum. Um, and through that time, I've seen a lot of different types of shopper marketing. And where I think we're at this interesting crossroads now where the science can be improved upon with the art side of, of marketing. So we're going to take a look at some work that um, was done outside of this company as well as a bit of a ground, um, we're going to lay a bit of groundwork in terms of what shopper marketing is and where the potential is and then start to get into a, hopefully a more inspirational place. Since I come out of the creative field, um, my background is not as deep in data as maybe some though I do understand its power of really driving great thinking and great ideas. So I'll share with you some data points up front, but if you have further questions around research, I'll do my best to answer them, but um, we'll, uh, we'll try and um, get the right people to, to weigh in um, as a follow-up if there's specific need in that space. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I believe those of us then in the call and also participating understand the word path to purchase. And it used to be seen as a funnel. And it was fairly direct. There was awareness. And then you drove further down the funnel, ultimately driving with a transactional purchase. But the realities are that this is much more convoluted, that this path has a series of starts and stops as you think about shoppers entering in various points through their shopping cycle. Sometimes they're using a mobile device. Sometimes they're using um, an actual cart in an aisle. But either way, there's various influences that are causing them to begin and to end their shopper sequence. So what's becoming more and more interesting is how are these other medias are crossing over into the world of shopper. So for example, this great fact from Google is 83% of viewers of a TV ad are actually searching for a product. And what I find even more interesting is what they're searching. So fashion and accessories, well, being a woman, that doesn't make a lot of a, uh, it's not a big surprise to me. I'll certainly look up a dress I might have seen or uh, a fashion accessory that my heart might have sparked to upon seeing an ad. And consumer electronics, which are much more involved purchase, doesn't surprise me much either. But when you look at this bottom point around food and beverage, that's where the interest really comes to bear. What I would consider maybe more rote purchases are getting as much involvement as some of these higher um, involvement categories. So even whether I'm going to get Pepsi or Coke tonight, or if there's a new flavor coming out, they're um, actually researching before they're making that final purchase decision. And 79% of these shoppers are relying on smartphones to help with their shopping. Well, being a mom, this isn't really surprising to me. I'm usually in a series of trying to update my list in the middle of an aisle, usually from a husband or some other family member giving me input. But also what they're doing with it is they're looking at pricing. They're deciding whether they're going to shop at this retailer versus a different retailer based on those prices. They're also looking at product information. Do I want crest with whitening or do I want crest with, uh, for sensitive teeth? And looking to see what people's reviews might be on those products in order to influence their purchase. They also oftentimes prefer using their phone actually to asking an associate. They feel this information sometimes is more reliable if they can determine the, the root or the import of where it's coming from. We also realize that 32% of shoppers are posting reviews or comments online. Um, and it's interesting how that influences, I think uh, Google and PNG did a study with, that they called the zero moment of truth. Because this research around my particular use of a product can influence someone else's purchase decision. And 94% are saying that this research has influenced their purchase decision. And 58% are saying it influenced them a lot. So as we think about a product's experience with a shopper or with an end consumer, that has a huge potential of impacting those new shoppers as they're looking down that product. We also know that 38 million people say purchase decisions are being influenced by social media. And I think with f-commerce and other um, social commerce kind of on the uptick, we shouldn't be too surprised by that fact. But I think the amount of time they're actually spending and the brands in which they're choosing to engage with um, is very interesting. So it's not just influenced by what my friends might say, but it's also what the brands might say within the social space. So therefore, it shouldn't come as any big surprise with this convoluted shopping path now that shoppers still expect this experience to be integrated. And the realities are that 80% are disappointed. So what this would make us think is that the power would be in the integration. It would be similar message, similar tone and tenor across all in integrated um, communications. And I think that's yes, but there's more to it than that. It's also about the power of the connection. 
And this is where I would like to go a little bit deeper in terms of how we actually um, are looking to amplify that connection with our shopper. And that's where the art as well as the science can really come to bear. So for example, so just for inspiration, I brought up Procter & Gamble's proud sponsor of moms. Now this is probably top of mind because there's a tremendous amount of media right now going on that um, talks about the Olympics partnership and Procter as they look at 2012 um, in London. However, this campaign was started in 2010 um, under the umbrella of proud sponsor of moms. And there was actually a pretty um, compelling television spot that was created by, I believe, Wyden and Kennedy um, that played and pulled at the heartstrings of moms. So the spot itself, if you're not familiar, showed a bunch of children on podiums um, accepting awards or children stepping out on the ice to, um, to skate or participating in Winter Olympic sports. And then at the very kind of pinnacle of the spot, you have a, what looks to be maybe an eight, 10 year old boy on skis re ready to go down a very large hill in, a, in terms of a jump. And you pan over to the audience and see this child's mom watching from the stands with that very like, gosh, I hope he does great look on her face. You can just feel her heart waiting. Um, and then it closes with the comment, to their moms, they'll always be kids. Then there's a quick sequence of logos flashing up and then it resolves on the PNG proud sponsor of mom's tag. So what's interesting is um, Procter & Gamble took, um, I believe it's a 30 second spot, and put the majority of the time based on this emotional connection, closing with a very heart stringy line, but very little impact on their logos and the brands themselves, and resolving on P&G, which was one of the few times Procter & Gamble as a brand was brought to market. So potentially the most compelling is the viewers of this ad, moms probably, particularly, felt such a resonance emotionally with this spot that 16% of the viewers of this spot went online and searched for what Procter & Gamble was and how they could participate. So they felt such an emotional connection, they wanted to figure out what brands or what they could do to actually be part of this company that really gets me or understands me as a mom. So that helps us start to see that it's actually a combination of the rational, but also the power of that emotional connection that drives that um, bigger connection with our shopper and has a bigger opportunity of influencing purchase. So once we looked at that spot and we really digest it further, kind of played with this emotional versus rational balance, we wanted to sit out and see if we could prove it here at Shock. So what could we do to play out this emotional connection and see if that actually delivered a fairly strong ROI? So working across our, our um, offices, we strive to create ideas to inspire the shopper rationally and emotionally. We also set, uh, set out to find ideas that would speak singularly to her heart as well as her mind. And an example I'm going to give you is one that one of our, um, our, our offices in uh, Europe worked on for Girl Spear. So the opportunity was to help this brand um, gain, share, and ultimately drive additional purchases within a very, very crowded landscape. So this is a US aisle shot. I haven't made it to Amsterdam in the last <laughs> blink, but uh, um, I believe their situation is very similar. It's a lot of brands on shop on shelf, and they're probably traditionally shopped with very rote behavior habits. Um, but Grolsch themselves, it is on this aisle, and it certainly doesn't pop out. It's actually pretty central underneath Guinness. Um, so how could you make a brand like a beer brand in such a cluttered environment stand out and ultimately drive increase of purchase? Well, we felt like the opportunity might lie not just in a, a price-driven or a benefit-driven communication, but also in an emotional connection with that shopper or that consumer. So the idea was to think about what was unique about the, the beer product itself and what was unique about that um, end shopper and consumer and how to drive that connection. So what we found was um, Grolsch Beer has a very um, big celebration around individuality and independent mentality. So they have a very independent brewing structure as well as a very independently shaped bottle. And what was interesting is that beer that strives so much to have that independent mindset could actually connect quite well and is connecting quite well with true characters for independent people. So as we think about the artists, the musicians, those that strive to kind of walk a little bit off the beaten path, that's the connection, that's the folks, those are the shoppers that Grolsch wants to uh, connect the heartstrings with, as well as their brand. So the team came up with a campaign that amplified that emotional connection through a shape language, really inspired by that unique, that independent spirit of the, of the bottle itself. 
So as you look through these um, communication pieces, you can see on the, for the musicians, the piano keys, you have the bottles as the black keys. As you look at the microphone, the bottle shape is embedded within that microphone. And even at events um, where these um, independent thinkers tend to want to come and celebrate, you have that bottle shape kind of being woven into those communications as well. So what we found is through that emotional connection, along with the rational, yes, we had to have the right price points within shelf for that were appropriate to this product, but we could start to see the health of the brand emerging. So you saw an increase in brand awareness. You also saw an increase in consideration. So we know the brand is healthy and that brand on Grolsch is really resonating. But the really interesting part is the case volume increase. So through this emotional connection, driving connection with those independent-minded souls and driving them that this is their beer because we're also similarly independent-minded, we get you on a heart way as well as a mind way, we were actually able to see an increase in sales. Additionally, I want to take you through uh, Lord & Taylor. So um, looking at it from a retailer standpoint, we felt, OK, we can start to understand how a brand can really have a strong, deep emotional connection with the shopper. But what about a retailer that has to hold a bunch of different brands? So we looked at um, Lord & Taylor themselves. And if we thought about Mother's Day, this was an opportunity to really test out this, um, this philosophy. So Mother's Day is also a very cluttered environment. Here's just a snapshot of things that were out this past Mother's Day. It's usually about deal. It's usually trying to get a retailer to be very top of their trip list, and usually with a selection of items that might be perfect for mom closely behind. For Lord and Taylor, we decided to take a step back and look at that emotional connection. And the, um, the idea we all rallied around was this things I've learned from mom. So hopefully everyone has a mom, whether they're um, close at hand or not, and they've learned things. Moms made an impression on their lives. So we, by allowing people to really share those experiences, we could connect a brand experience that allowed Lord and Taylor to get them and understand them, but also connect them with the retailer, ultimately hoping that we would create more awareness for the retailer and make it higher on her trip stop list. Well, this one looks a little funky through the image, but ultimately what we did is we had um, designers themselves get on board. So they shared with us things that they learned from their moms. And we also took it online. And we invited um, our, our social channels to participate and tell us what things um, they learned from mom. And of course, we were willing to reward them for their efforts. The realities at the end of this were we got a lot of information. We had great quotes from wonderful designers that were very heart -stringy. We had wonderful information from our shoppers about things mom shared with them and taught them. And we had video content as well that they were willing to share. And then we took that content and we actually brought it to the windows of Lord Taylor. So now these um, bits of wisdom that were given from mom, they were actually brought to the retailer themselves. And there was a little bit of celebrity for those shoppers if their uh, quotes were chosen. But additionally, it felt very authentic and it felt very truthful. And it felt like a logical place that Lord & Taylor could be, understanding moms as well as the shopper for this time of year. And second quarter results are not published yet, so I can't share those with you de in detail. But at least from what we can tell you, we know social media involvement went up over 200%, which has brought our Facebook fans for Lord & Taylor up well over the 200,000s. And I'll take one more quick retailer, and this one is just unveiling at the moment for the Home Depot. So if we're starting to feel traction around this connection between the shopper emotionally as well as rationally, what about the Home Depot? Let's look at even men, if shall we say. Maybe the, the I'll say, a little bit lesser sometimes of the emotional spectrum. Um, how could we connect with them emotionally as well as rationally? What would that help us do? What might that achieve for us? And luckily for us, we were given a tremendous opportunity in the um, heart of New York for the Manhattan flagship Home Depot store. They asked Shock to look at recreating their windows. Now, this is actually at a point of unveiling right now. So those of you that are lucky enough to live close to New York City, you can go ahead and look at it yourselves. And please give me your feedback as to how you feel it's going. Um, but as um, for us, we wanted to see what could we do that was more than what was being done currently. Now, this is the past. Um, windows that were up prior to our involvement. And you'll see very product-centric stories around those windows. Um, beautifully done and beautifully or propped. Um, but is there an opportunity to make more of an emotional connection as well as the product feature? So conveniently, this is all unveiling around the time of the 4th of July. And there's a lot of heart for that holiday, a lot of strong Americana, certainly in the halls and in the um, 
the streets of New York. So we did want to make sure we played off that emotional um, connection. But we went deeper when it came to the windows themselves. Let's invite our shoppers as they're walking by to really be inspired by this retailer and what it could do for a much more urban setting for them. So around um, the image you're seeing on the far left around make a bold statement. How could we really um, invite them to come into the store and find these beautiful things that they may not have thought Home Depot could provide for them, but in a very inspired way? Inv invite them to make a bold statement within their homes with some beautiful lighting fixtures. To the right, you see color your summer more stylish. Invite them to be inspired by color with Home Depot as their ally. And then uh, in the lower is that call out that connects them to some digital tools that Home Depot has available um, through the App Store to help them even take that experience with them. And even ceiling fans, which could seem like a very menial product centric purchase, but here even by artfully pitching them um, perpendicular from the ceiling, so you're not looking up, they're actually turning and moving through that window display right at you. And of course, reminding you to keep your cool, but now we're nodding to array and inspiration a bit more across that line than simply saying we have ceiling fans. And we're also peppering in communications that drive them to digital. So recognizing our shoppers might need to do some investigative work prior to coming in and deciding what they want. We want to help them connect to the homedepot.com um, mobile site so that they can sign up for savings specifically, but also find and browse more products and more tools to help them make a purchase. Now the reality is this is opening now, so I hope I'll have brilliant results shortly to share with all of you. But um, we do believe that by starting to do this emotional connection as well as the rational, we should see some interesting um, ROI in the near term. So ultimately here we believe based on that inspiration we saw P&G kind of break the mold on, we believe we're starting to prove something pretty powerful. We believe that the true potential of shopper marketing is as found as much in the heart of the matter as it is in the pocketbook. And that's what I have for you all today. Um, I'm going to try and figure out how I enable questions, and um, I look forward to hearing more. We can dialogue around this work. Sorry, I'm having trouble trying to get the questions to pop up. Um, let me hit a couple of key ones that I think we might be starting to hear if um, I can figure out how to enable it. Um, at least ones that I thought might um, be things I'm hearing from my clients. But one is usually around clean store policy. So um, how can we um, connect with shoppers emotionally when you're dealing with clean store? And this is really an interesting conversation because uh, brands specifically have a lot less real estate in order to do those emotional um, drives. So we feel like that's in the combination of medias. So as you think of where you connect your, through digital medias or through packaging, um, you saw the beautiful packs um, for Grolsch and that bottle shape. Are there ways of driving those other intrinsics to help make that emotional connection? And then also I think as you, as you work through key visuals that might live within that real estate, it's that balance between big, bold um, graphics and um, benefit communication. And the other piece is really understanding where your brand may sit or retailer may sit within product life. So that it would be a newer brand, for example, or a newer product launch. You probably want to go deeper on the rational though a more stable brand that folks are much more aware of the benefits of, let's say a Coke product, for example, you might just, uh, you might be able to skew much higher on the emotional quadrant. So as you think of those two things and you layer in your, um, your clean store policy, how much you dial up one or the other should be indicative of the life 
um, stage of your brand or product and also the amount of real estate you have available and what other tools you might have available to use as well. Um, another question I often get is around data. You know, how much of a role should data um, play in, um, in the shopper space? And obviously the answer is huge. Data is a key driver and a key insight miner for us, especially as creative people. But I think the balance is in making sure the data doesn't cripple you. So data can be a great enabler and hope you uncover some new things. However, from that point you need to have a creative inspiration and a jumping off point and be willing to stretch and potentially test and learn um, how much emotion you should dial up and how, for, how much you allow creativity to take over that charge. And then usually the last question I get is around ROI. How do you know it's going to drive ROI? And the realities are we never know, right? I'm sure when P&G went to market in 2010 with that Olympics campaign, they weren't exactly sure they'd see the sales lift that they ended up seeing. Um, so it is a little bit of a leap of faith potentially, but I think if, if we start to um, be authentic in our connection and our resonance with that shopper and it comes from a truthful place and we allow creativity based in data and insight to be the driver of that inspiration, that we will see a stronger ROI. Certainly in a retailer space, ROI becomes more loyalty or stickiness, um, but from a brand or a product central um, view, it's much more about um, increased purchase, right? Or repeat purchase. And then lastly, I think we talk about um, does this emotional connection with the shoppers work primarily in store? And the answer there I feel, and we've gone through a few examples, is absolutely not. That that emotional connection should be dialed up appropriately across medias. We know when she's looking deep for information about uh, efficacy about a product that probably that's the place to let the efficacy play through and the RTB really, um, really show. But there's other places, particularly social media or particularly maybe YouTube, where that um, emotional bit can even play up higher. And where you have imagery, that's another great way to really um, knock that one out of the park. So um, this is what I have for everyone today. I apologize I'm not doing such a great job using my filters to see all the questions. Um, but I uh, hope if you have some, you can certainly reach out to me directly. My email is attached here on this last screen. And um, I'd love to have further dialogue around whether you guys feel this um, this is pro a provocative stance for shopper marketing or um, uh, something that certainly is a, things you're already doing and traction you're starting to see. It really puts the power a bit more in a creative art camp than strictly, I think, much more of the science, which shopper marketing seems to have been residing for a very long time. So if there's creative people participating, I guess I'd ask you to pick up the torch. I think we have a big job to do of really um, bringing the bar higher for shopper marketing as an inspirational, creative space and um, a little less maybe in just trying to um, be quite so efficacy driven. So thank you everyone for participating and thank you for everyone.